I'd like to take a couple of minutes just to uh, meet our speaker, David Cook, although I think we worked out this was about visit number seven through either men's conventions or summer or Easter. So great to have you back again. Thank you. Um, you've... Uh, um, have Maxine, your wife, with you today, and that's great, but tell us about your family. Uh, we've been married nearly 42 years. Uh, we have five children, four of whom are married, and we have 12 grandchildren. So what's the secret about being a great father <laughs> or grandfather? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know either the answer to either of those. There's no automatic formulas. Uh, you're always learning. Uh, you have to, you love your children, you have fun with them and you discipline them. Uh, there's lots, you just got to keep on your toes because you think by the time you get to 60 you've learnt all of life's lessons, but you haven't because your children marry and then you've got to get used to in-laws and then you've got to get used to grandchildren and everything is always in a constant state of change. I think um, those early years, I, I think if there was one thing I carried with me is that it's the same being a principal at a Bible college, you know, or being a pastor. I'm your principal, I'm not your friend. I'm your pastor, I'm not your friend, and I'm your father, I'm not your friend. Um, that's the reality. Your children can get friends everywhere, but they can only have one father or mother, and that's you. And so you've got to be the father or mother, because their friends won't be the, fa the paternal or maternal in uh, influence in their life. So if you are a parent, be a parent. That's what I'd say. Now, it's lovely to have warm, cosy relations with them, but primarily I'm called to be a father, not a friend. I'm called to be a principal, not a friend. I'm called to be a pastor, not a friend. So you're the unfriendly principal. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah good, so... on, good on you, Dave. You just wrecked the whole lot of that. You know, so, when Australians call each other buffhead, you know it's a mark of great affection. He's a buffhead. <laughs> so when you were last with us, you were still principal of a Bible college and you've been principal of a Bible college for 26 years and yeah. now you're free of that. But oh, isn't it great? Yeah. You, you know the it. feeling. Yeah, I do. Um, but, you know, people out here, they probably think principal of a Bible college, 26 years, you probably know everything there is to know about the Christian life and theology and walking with God and the fullness of the Spirit. And What, what have you learned since you left Bible college? <laughs> um, oh, you just keep on growing and learning. You le the old truths are the truths you've got to keep going back and learning again and again because we are sinful. Um, and, they, you know, you always meet people who come up and tell you they haven't sinned since 1960 or something like that. And they're usually men and they usually don't have their wife with them. I want to know where their wife is. <laughs> um, so you're sinful. I'm sinful. I'm impatient. I need to go back and learn uh, the graces. The Becoming time. a cranky old man? Yeah. My, uh, look, David, what sort of an interview is this? <laughs> I remember you interviewed me on a couple of occasions. Yeah, okay. so. <laughs> well, Maxine told me the other day I was becoming a cranky old man, and I had to admit I was. But the funny thing about that was the things that were making me cranky, like we went to the Opera House one night for a concert, and the bloke behind kept tapping my chair. I think, oh, good grief. I go and buy my petrol, and the bloke wants to give me two chocolate bars for the price of one. Uh, you don't want to know. Anyway, uh, when, when, I, when I tell blokes my age, you know, this that Maxine says I'm becoming a cranky old man and what makes me cranky, they can hardly wait to tell me what makes them cranky. <laughs> what makes you cranky? Uh, no. <laughs> you... <laughs> tell us what, what... Good to ask you this question, I think. Why do you think Bible college ministry is important? Because when I went to school, in high school, they graded us academically. My mother took me into 1A, first year high school, Latin, and I didn't make it. No cook was read out. 1B, second classics class, no cook. 1C, accounting, commerce, no cook. 1D, second accounting, commerce class, no cook. 1E, woodwork, metalwork, tech drawing, cook. 
That's why you need to go to college. <laughs> Uh, and what, I tell you what I missed, and I've always felt the missing, because I was in the lower classes in first and second and third year at high school, I never got to study poetry. I never got to study poetry. And I feel the lack of that. I feel the lack whenever I pick up the Bible. I feel the lack when I pick up poetic books. I feel the lack of that education. Now, I'm very fortunate because in latter years of high school and etc., I was able to pick up education, but I never got over the lack of those early years. Um, I don't think ignorance ever serves. Knowledge serves. And so get as much education as you can. Look at the Apostle Paul. He was a well-educated Pharisee. Look at the lives of the early Christians, people like Oregon, Justin Martyr. They were, before they became Christian, they were beautifully educated people, and God used all that. I'm not saying that you've got to have that for God. To, you can have that, and God won't use you if you don't know the power of the Holy Spirit in your own life. But it's a wonderful thing in our nation to have educational facilities and to avail yourself of those educational facilities and get all the education you can because I'm better off for knowing things than not knowing them. And so going to colleges is a great thing to have a, a good faithful college here in your own city where you can go and send your children and your grandchildren is a great blessing of God. And so give thanks for it and guard it jealously. Mm, good. Now, you've become an itinerant preacher wandering the world, uh, but you're still writing. So yeah. what's this little thing you've got here? Well, the, the, up in the bookshop there, there's a little book that I wrote on Romans. I think Romans is one of the key books of the New Testament, and you must understand Romans if you are going to mature as a Christian. And so 10 of those.com over in the UK got me to do 50 Bible studies through Romans. And so this takes you through the whole of Romans in 50 days. Each day gives you the reading, it gives you a comment, and it gives you uh, something to reflect about. We need to use our brains, and Romans stretches our brains and causes great glory to God. And so for 50 days, over the next 50 days or so, you can take your quiet times one a day and move yourself gradually through Romans. Now, these are available in the bookshop over there. I think they're $6.50, and you can pick them up and pick them up for your friends as well. I think this is a great investment in your own soul's health to get to dig into Romans and the great truths that are there. Because as I'm about to say, Romans answers the very biggest of big questions that we all must face. And this book will help you with it. So that would be a great follow through after listening to you all weekend, would it? Yes. Keep yes. listening for another 50 days. Yeah, that's right. That's okay. right. The message of Romans. Thank you, David. Great to have you with us. Please read God's word Thank for you. us. If you'd like to open your Bibles, which at our church, that means flip open your phones uh, for most people. But uh, um, open your Bibles or your phones, whatever you've got there. And I'm going to read from Romans 1.18. Now, in this first session this morning, I'm going to be preaching from Romans 1.18 through to chapter 3, verse 20. So we're going to be moving at some pace. But let me just read Romans 1.18 to 1.32. If I might say so, I cannot think of a more politically incorrect passage of Scripture to be preaching on in Australia today. I think if this got to the media, that the things I was going to say, I think I'd be on 7.30 report this day tonight or whatever it is. These words are horrifying to the world we live in. But this is God's truth. The wrath of God, verse 18, is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, that is his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals 
and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. And may God add his blessing to that reading of his holy word and to his name be glory and praise. Now, the outline of what I have to say in this first sermon is on page six of your booklets there. And uh, if you have your Bibles open in front of you at Romans 1, let's pray. Our Father, thank you for breathing this word out to us by your Holy Spirit. Thank you that through the centuries you've kept this word safe and brought it to us in our heart language. We are blessed people, our Heavenly Father, to be able to live, to, to meet freely and openly with your word before us. We know on this Good Friday that many of your people suffer a persecution and threat. And we pray that your blessing would be upon them as we need your blessing now to open tired eyes and deaf ears so that we hear and see the truth and respond in repentance and faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1991, I was taking a trip to Rome. A friend of mine was a prominent, is a prominent Roman Catholic barrister in Sydney, and he asked me, would I like him to get me an audience with Pope John Paul II? I said, that'd be very nice. I could imagine the photo on the front of the SNBC News of me with the Pope. And so we got the audience. I turned up on the Thursday morning to the Vatican. There were 7,000 7, others that day having an audience with the Pope. We were in a large meeting hall like this, and I was one of the 7,000. I've kept the ticket. Here it is. It was a special ticket. It says I've got seat in row C, number 141. But here it says in dark, bold lettering, Reparto Speciali, which meant that I had the seat on the aisle. And that was a prized seat. Because when the Pope came down after delivering his sermon in seven different languages, he stops at the end of each aisle and the person at the end of that aisle gets a photo with the Pope and gets the opportunity perhaps to say a few words to him. So I thought I'm going to take the opportunity of saying a few words to the Pope. Now, as it turned out, the Berlin Wall had just collapsed and the Pope that day did not get beyond the front row where there were some Russian and East German believers. He just stayed with them. So I didn't get my opportunity to have my photo or my message delivered to the Pope. But I had it ready. It was three words. And my message to the Pope was this. Rome needs Romans. Rome needs Romans. Melbourne needs Romans. Sydney needs Romans. There is not a city in the world, there is not a person on the planet who does not need Romans and massive doses of it. What is Romans about? Look at Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Here is the human author, Paul. Look at the self-effacing way in which he introduces himself. His name literally means little. Paul, slave, belonging to Christ Jesus. Self-effacing, isn't it? 
No limelight on him, no spotlight on the apostle. It's not about an institution. It's not about an apostle. Called to be an apostle. Set apart, fenced off. For what? What is he a slave of? What is he set apart for? The gospel. Literally, the momentous news. You go back in the first century and say, oh, this word, this word you've got gospel here, it means good news. Good news? No, it doesn't. It means big news. It means life-changing news. It means momentous news, like the day my father came into my bedroom in November 1963 and told me they'd just killed the President of the United States. The day I went to Bible college and the principal cancelled lectures in July 1969 and we watched as a man put a foot on the moon. One small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Momentous news, September the 11th, 2001. Momentous news, that's gospel. The emperor's wife has had his firstborn son. A great victory has been won in battle, that's gospel. It is the momentous news, but look at what it says there in verse 1. It is the momentous news which belongs to God. It doesn't belong to us. We're not free to edit it. We don't stand over it. We don't add to it. We don't subtract from it. Paul doesn't get in the way of this momentous news. This is what Romans is all about. And verse 2 tells us that this gospel, this momentous news, was promised beforehand through the Old Testament. And verse 3 tells us it's all about Jesus regarding his son and two things about Jesus. One, his humanity. Verse 3, he was a descendant of David. And verse 4, his deity, who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead. He is the perfect God. He is the perfect man. He bridges the gap between God and man. This momentous news is all about how God bridges the gap between himself and humanity. And go down to Paul's three I am statements. Look at verse 14. I am under obligation to all races of people, Greeks and non-Greeks, and to all classes, wise and foolish. I'm indebted to them. And that is why, verse 15, I am eager. I am so eager. It's a rare word in the New Testament. I am single-mindedly committed to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome. And verse 16, I am not ashamed of this gospel. I know I'm coming to Nero's Rome. I know I'm coming to this place of all the power of Nero, where steel, sword, steel, spear, it rains. But I'm coming with a message which will turn the world upside down. As one ancient historian said, the day will come when men will call their dogs Nero and their sons Paul. And I come, I come unashamed because this is God's instrument whereby he changes people. He does what Marxism can never do. He changes people. He saves them, first the Jew and then the Gentile. Why would I be ashamed of this power of God for the salvation of all who believe? And this is what this letter is about, he says, verse 17, in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is from first to last, from, by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. That's it. How does the righteous God set unrighteous people in the right with him in a righteous way? It's the biggest question of all, isn't it? How can I, unrighteous as I am, no credits to my account, be in the right with the righteous God? How can he put me right with him in a righteous way and still be righteous himself? And Paul says that's what this letter is about. It's about no little question. It is about the biggest question that you will face in the light of eternity. And so he starts, verse 18, the wrath of God. You would expect, would you not, if God is righteous, that he is going to be a God of wrath. He's going to be angry about certain things because he is righteous. And so here from 118 through to chapter 3, verse 20, Paul gives us the bad news first. He tells us about ourselves. Here is God's diagnosis of humanity. In our shopping centre back in Sydney, a man by the name of Wade Franken one Saturday afternoon goes to the shopping centre. The mall is full of people. He goes to the local coffee shop. He puts his bag by his table. He pulls out an automatic weapon and a machete and he proceeds to kill randomly seven people. Just like that. Before taking his own life. 
Seven people who'd just gone shopping. Saturday afternoon, Monday morning, the most popular radio announcer in Sydney says this about Wade Frankham and what he did. This is a mongrel world. Who has the answer? This is a mongrel world. Who has any answer? John Calvin, when he started the great institutes of the Christian religion, this is what he says. All true wisdom consists of two parts, knowledge of God and knowledge of ourselves, and these two are connected by many ties. We don't want God. We don't know ourselves. We don't want God. We don't understand the human condition. We are totally ignorant about ourselves because we've cut ourselves off from God. In the 1970s, I remember, people were preaching the Holy Spirit, the great neglected person of the Trinity. In the 1980s, I heard John Stott say, if I was going to a church today, I'd spend the first 12 months preaching nothing but the doctrine of the church. The 1990s, it was the Bible, the inerrancy debate. What is the Bible? In the first part of the 20th century, I think the emphasis ought to be on what we believe about people. Do you understand you? Do we understand the human condition? Why did Wade Frankham do that? We have people running around and say, we're basically good, we make bad choices. What nonsense that is. And so here is God's diagnosis of the human condition. Listen to it. Look, the fact of God's wrath, verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven. The reason for his wrath, verse 18, because of godlessness, we have no respect for God and wickedness, we have no respect for one another. And we suppress the truth about God from one another. That is the greatest disrespect. And we do it without excuse. Look at verse 20, because God has revealed himself in the created order. It is a limited revelation, but it is a clear revelation. He reveals that he is eternally powerful and he is a divine nature. And it is clearly seen, Paul says, from what has been made so that men are without excuse. And in the light of that clear revelation from the created order, what do we do? Look at verse 23 and 25. He repeats the word. We exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man, birds, animals and reptiles. Verse, 30, verse 25. The exchange, they exchange the truth of God for a lie, the lie, literally, and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. So here is the exchange. It is the lie. We take the creation, which tells us that there is a God who is eternally powerful and divine, and we worship the creation and ignore the creator. We exchange the creation for the creator. And that is the lie of idolatry. And notice God's passive judgment. The wrath of God is being revealed, not actively like in Sodom and Gomorrah, but passively. It's like the adolescent who says to the parent, I never want to see you again. And the ultimate judgment of the parent, you never will see me again. We say to God, I don't want you. I want the creation. Very well. Verse 24, I'll give you over. Verse 26, I'll give you over. Verse 28, I'll give you over. And you'll bear the fruit of your choice. And here is the fruit of idolatry, which is the great lie. Verse 24, all kinds of uncleanness, unclean activity. Verse 26, scrambled sexuality. Verse 28, a mind which is perverse and incapable of making proper moral judgments. All the fruit of idolatry. See verse 24? He says to impurity, degrading your bodies with one another. Verse 26, God gave them over to what? To shameful lusts. Uh, even their women, he lists women first. One Victorian commentator says, well, he lists women first because women are the last to be corrupted morally. It's a quaint Victorian idea, isn't it? Even their women exchange natural relations for unnatural ones. And their men abandon natural relations with women and are inflamed with passion for one another, a passion that can never be fulfilled. We call it, and we join in with our perverse society and call it gay. And they bear in themselves the penalty for their own perversion. They have this deep need, and it will never be met in this way. Now, let me say, as we come down to verse 28, 
the net widens and God gave them over to all these forms of filled with every kind of wickedness, 29, evil, greed, depravity, envy, murder, strife, gossips. They disobey their parents. 31, they're senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Now, these apply to all of us to some degree. Let me say that it may well be that your particular area of temptation is same-sex attraction. And I want to say two things to you this morning, if that's the case. One, I'm glad, really glad you're here. And two, I would encourage you to make yourself accountable to someone, a senior, mature Christian, to whom you can make yourself accountable, because this is a very strong passion, and it needs to be resisted. It's the fruit of idolatry. You wanted Alan Jones say, it's a mongrel world, isn't it? Yes, it's a world with an aggressive infection. And we apply the antibiotic to the aggressive infection. And what is the antibiotic we apply? Well, legislation, political. Oh, come the 14th of September, we'll get rid of this lot and we'll have another lot. Oh, that'll change everything, won't it? That's the answer. Education, philosophy, sociology, economics. What nonsense it is. Friends, I love Australia. I am a radical Australian nationalist. I love the sunburned country. But there's not a day goes by that I do not feel more isolated in this land. I'm out of place. Out of place. There is no antibiotic that can solve this problem unless it is a theological antibiotic. Yet we insist, don't we? Wasn't the interview with Tony Abbott the other night? You're a Christian. You're a man of Christian conviction. Yes, I am. For millions of Australians, the Christian faith means a very great deal. Can you guarantee us that Christianity will not have an effect on your policy making? Yes, I can guarantee you that. <laughs> oh, you can. Well, then what will affect the policy that you make? Is it a moral vacuum? We require our Christians. We'll elect them, OK? Just don't be a Christian in office. Well, you can be a Marxist. That's fine. Just don't be a Christian. It is perverse. And here we throw every antibiotic on the problem of this mongrel world, except the one that will actually take and be effective, and that is the theological antibiotic of the momentous news of the gospel. But Paul's not on about that yet. We go into chapter two and look, he isolates three attitudes and maybe you can identify them in others and in yourself. Look at chapter two, verse one. The first is the self-righteous moralist, the person who comes from chapter one and says, well, I'd never do those sorts of things. Look at verse one. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on others, because you who pass judgment do the same things. Verse 3, so when you, a man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, do you think you'll escape God's judgment? He's the self-righteous moralist who's constantly passing judgment. Look at what he says, verse 4, and you think that because life's going well, it's God's seal of approval on you. Do you show, verse 4, contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance and patience, not realising that God's kindness leads you towards repentance? But because of your stubbornness, literally your sclerosis, the hardening of the arteries around your heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. See, here's your problem. Your problem is not you. Your biggest problem is not sin. Your biggest problem is God. You're going to face him. Verse 6, God will give to each and every person according to what he has done. Verse 11, for God does not show favoritism. That's your problem. You're going to front up to him. The self-righteous moralist. You think by looking down your nose at others and feeling morally superior and passing proper moral judgments, well, you're exempt from God's judgment. You're not. And verse 12 to 16, do I hear the unreached national say, well, God can't us hold, hold us accountable because we never knew the Ten Commandments. We never heard about Jesus. And Paul says, no, God will not hold you accountable to what you did not know. All who sin apart from the law will perish apart from the law. And those who sin under the law will be judged by the law. But this is what it's going to be like on judgment day. Look at verse 16. 
on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares, your conscience will accuse you because you knew that you had done what was wrong according to your conscience, and sometimes your conscience will defend you because sometimes you did what was right. But you'll have an accusing conscience in there. And you'll stand guilty before God. Well, let the unreached nationals stay unreached. They're better off. No, they're not. Because they have a conscience which accuses them. And on the day when men's secrets are revealed, their conscience will lay them bare before the piercing glaze of God. Thirdly, what about you Jews? Verse 17, if you call yourself a Jew... If you make all the claims, look at verse 19, you think you're a guide for the blind, a light for those in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you've got the law, the embodiment of the knowledge of God. Well, you're hypocrites, aren't you? You teach others. Do you teach yourself? God's name, verse 24, is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of like that, who are so two-faced, such hypocrites. They tell us one thing, but they do the opposite themselves. You Jews are laid bare. You self-righteous moralist. You unreached national. You Jew. And don't come to me, look at verse 25 and say, well, we've got circumcision. You can't take that away from us. We'll, we'll shelter under the shade of circumcision. He says, what nonsense that is. Circumcision in the flesh means nothing. What matters is that circumcision in the flesh is indicative of a heart that is circumcised. Look at verse 29. A man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. You're as guilty as those in chapter 1. You self-righteous person, you Jew, you unreached national. We stand laid bare and guilty before God. Those of you who ever heard the great Billy Graham preach will know that sometimes he just stopped in the middle of his sermon and he entered into a conversation with you. The way he did that, he'd say, but Billy, you may ask. And he asks himself the very question which you're asking. And he answers that question. It's dialogical. And here Paul stops. Chapter 3, verse 1, he says, do I hear someone say then, well, what advantage is there in being a Jew? Why be Jewish if we're going to be judged like everyone else? And Paul goes on as though he's going to give us a whole list of advantages of being a Jew. He says, verse 2, much in every way. First of all, and he only gives us one, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. In other words, the Jews went beyond the creation revelation and they received words. They received propositions. God spoke through Moses to them. They had the wonderful advantage of being the first to receive words from God. Words of redemption, words of holiness, words of covenant, words of election. They didn't see that in the created order, but the Jew did. You've got every advantage. Oh, but to some say, look at verse 3. Well, then, look, if we are faithless, that doesn't relieve God from the duty of being faithful. He's still got to be faithful. And Paul says, not at all, verse 4. Let God be true and every man a liar. For David writes when he is exposed about his sin with Bathsheba in Psalm 51, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. In other words, God is right, and David recognises that God is right to punish him for his disobedience and his sin. And Paul is saying that God, just because God judges the Jew doesn't mean that God is being faithless. He is being faithful to his covenant promises to bless and to curse. And do I hear some of you say, verse 5, but if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? Let us go on being unrighteous. Let us go on being faithless. Because God's faithful response will show that he really is faithful compared to our unfaithfulness. And Paul sums up in verse 8, let us do evil that good may result. Your condemnation is deserved. What a perverse way of arguing. Well, there it is. The Gentile pagan, the idolater, 
the self-righteous moralist, the unreached national, the good Jew, all on a level playing field, all short of God's righteous standard. And so Paul now comes to summarise from verse 9 of chapter 3, and he summarises like every rabbi. He just lets scripture speak, Psalm, Ecclesiastes, Isaiah. What shall we conclude? Are we any better? Not at all, we Jews. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are under sin, and here are the scriptures. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless because they don't do the very things they're created to do. There is no one who does good, not even one. In our character, we are short without exception. At our college, we used to every year get all the students to stand in front of the main building, men in shirt, collar and tie and coat, women dressed appropriately, and we take the photo, the college photo, all the faculty, all the students. Three or four weeks later, the students would go to the office because the prince had arrived and a student would pick up the photo and who was the first person they'd look for? Themselves. What do I look like in the photo? Have I lost that much hair? Have I got that many chins? Oh, that's not a good photo. Oh, no, Mabel, that's not a good photo. That's badly focused. Bruce, don't you worry. That's a bad photo. That's a bad photo. Oh, that's not me, surely. I'm an exception. Here is God's perfectly focused photograph of you and me. No one, not even one, no one, no one, all together, no one, not even one. We all stand before God. Not one of us have the right to be morally superior to anybody else. Not one, no one, no one. I'm an exception. No. There are no exceptions. And Paul proves his point now, notice, by referring to six bodily parts. Look at verse 13. Six parts of your body. One, your throat. Their throats are open graves. What is an open grave? A place of uncleanness, of rotting stench. That's your words. Their tongues practice deceit. Don't trust what they say. Oh, they're smooth and oily. They'll seduce you with the tongue. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Just under their lips, literally, was the asp. Will strike you and kill you. Destructive words. Their mouths, notice, are full of cursing and bitterness. Full of it. When I was in Parish one day, I remember the old days of the Builders Labourers Federation, they were building a shopping mall opposite the manse. And one Monday morning in my preparation, I was having a cup of coffee, so I wandered over because I noticed it was Smoko across the road and they were having a stop work meeting with the Builders Labourers Federation. I had my old jeans on, so I went over and mixed with the blokes. And I tell you, I heard words there I have not heard in a church after church coffee time. Their mouths were full full of cursing and bitterness. Because Jesus said, you want to know what's on the heart? Listen. The mouth will tell you what's on the heart. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. And then you look at verse 15. He then goes for the feet. So if your feet are often in your mouth, I guess it's five parts of your body relating to this area. Throat, tongue, lip, mouth, feet. Their feet are swift to shed innocent blood. Their feet are swift to shed innocent blood. Chrissy Swan, media personality. She's on that can of worms show on Channel 10. Tearfully looking into the camera and crying, confessing that in her pregnancy, where she is now pregnant, she has been smoking. It's so hard to give up cigarettes. I'm sorry. I know that this can affect the baby, she said. A teary confession. And Meredith Nash, the feminist comes out in response and says, I do not approve of such teary confessions. I hope that this doesn't revive fetal rights issues. The rights of the child in utero. And Ian Lavers, in the same paper that I was reading, the president of the Queensland Police Association, who is appearing before the Queensland Child Protection Unit, is arguing that he believes that laws should be revived which give legal rights to the fetus. 
that the mother in, can act in any way she pleases, but if she acts in such a way deliberately to bring bad health to that fetus, she should be charged. He said, of course, but the Queensland Police Union are not talking about abortion. That is a completely separate issue. <laughs> <laughs> What's separate about it? What is more confronting to the health of the child in the womb than abortion? 1967, they liberalised the abortion laws in the United Kingdom. Since then, there have been 8 million abortions. 8 million abortions. A new holocaust that is never mentioned. And in September this year at the Melbourne Cricket Ground, you can go down there and there will be at the Melbourne Cricket Ground 120,000 people for the grand final. And you can fill that stadium and you can fill the Etihad Stadium as well. And you've got about the number of abortions we have in Australia every year. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Innocent blood. Is there more innocent blood? than the blood of the unborn, ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they do not know. And Paul finishes with a quote from Psalm 36. He goes to the eyes. Go back, if you would, to Psalm 36 and let's just look at what that psalm actually says. Psalm 36. It's an oracle, a heavy word to David. Psalm 36, verse 1. An oracle is within my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. And here is the quote Paul uses. There is no fear of God before his eyes. Because in the understanding of the Hebrew, the eye was the window to the soul. And so we are the way we are because there is no fear of God. There is no reverence for God. Because we do not reverence God, certain things follow. What follows? Look at verse 2. For in his own eyes, he flatters himself too much to detect or hate his sin. It's like that lady John Wesley writes about in his diary. He says, I saw a lady tonight after the meeting. She came up to me and said, oh, Mr. Wesley, please pray for me, for I am a sinful woman. I said, indeed, I shall, madam, for indeed you are. How dare you speak to me like that? She said, <laughs> just take her at a word. Oh, I'm so sinful. Indeed you are. How dare you? In their own eyes, they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin. Verse 3, the words of their mouth are wicked and deceitful. They've ceased to do wise and do good. Even on his bed when he's quite alone, even there where there's no stress of life on him, even there where he can't blame anyone else, he commits himself to a sinful course and he does not reject what is wrong. Why? Because there is no fear of God. There is no sense of reverence. There is no respect for God. He doesn't know God, so he doesn't respect or know himself. These two are connected by many ties. So back to Romans chapter 3, and Paul now sums up in two verses. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. There is no excuse for any of us. There is nothing uh, that encourages you to be morally superior to anybody else. It is a level playing field. Notice the law is there so that all excuses are silenced and we are held accountable to God. No one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law, it's rather through the law, we become conscious of our sin. That's what the law does to us. I once heard a bishop in the Diocese of Sydney say he got on a train at Central Railway Station. It was an old carriage. As he looked up on the wall, he saw penalty, uh, spitting prohibited, penalty for spitting, 20 pounds. He said even as he read the sign, he could feel the saliva building up in his mouth. <laughs> The Grimm's fairy tale, the mother goes to the shops and says, children, while I'm gone, I don't want any of you to put any peas in your ears or beans up your nose. She comes home and they're rolling around trying to get the peas out of the ears and the beans out of the nose. You tell me what to do and I'll do the very opposite. That's the law. And no one will be justified in his sight by observing the law. Rather, the law makes us conscious of sin. So I go to my doctor, I'm sweating, I've got a fever. 
The doctor takes my temperature. He says, oh, you do have a fever. Now, my prescription is you take this thermometer home and take your temperature three times a day and come back to me in a week and we'll see how you're going. I say, what? I need an antibiotic. That thermometer tells me I've got a fever. Doesn't solve the problem. And the law's like that. Don't throw the law at me. Don't tell me to keep the Ten Commandments. I can't do it. It just tells me I've got a problem. I need a solution. I don't need any more proof that I've got a problem. I am not good. And I need a solution. And if you go to verse 21, because we can hardly hold ourselves back, can we, from getting onto the momentously good news, but now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known, but we will not go there. Because too often we appreciate ourselves and depreciate God and we need to let the momentously bad news about ourselves sink into our being. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to your cross I cling. Naked, turn to you for dress. Helpless, look to you for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Saviour, or I die. You see, it's, it's wonderful, isn't it? that Christianity is so realistic. All of the religions come along and tell me what to do. I can't do any of it. And then they threaten me with the most dreadful punishment if I don't do what I can't do. They're doubly cruel. Christianity knows that. And God knows that. He knows me through and through. He knows I can't do anything. He hasn't told me to do one thing yet. He's just telling me that I've got an enormous problem. Now, last week, the last four weeks, I've been the apologist in residence at Trinity Grammar School, 1,200 boys in Sydney in senior school. And the other day, I preached to every one of them from year seven to year 12 in their year groups. And I told them three reasons why I was a Christian and three reasons why most Australians weren't. And the first reason why most Australians are not Christian is that they think that they're basically OK. They appreciate themselves. I mean, they're not Hitler. So we'll be OK. And yet God has given his precious son, his priceless gift, his one and only. And we bump up to heaven, good old Aussies, as they let me in. You've come to my heaven, clinging to your own puny goodness, having ignored the supreme gift of my son, and think you can come in? What utter foolishness. Nothing. Naked. Helpless. Foul. Nothing but there is a cross. Naked but there is a dress. Helpless but there is grace. Foul. But there is a fountain filled with blood. Flowing from Emmanuel's veins. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, you Jew. And the whole world, you pagan idolater, you unreached Gentile, you'll be held accountable to God, you self-righteous moralist. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. This righteous God will not set unrighteous people right with him by their own puny efforts at legal obedience. Rather, the law has been given that we might become conscious of sin. Well, let's pray. How good you are, righteous God, to speak to us, that we have been entrusted with the very words of God. What great advantage, what great blessing that is. And we pray, our Heavenly Father, that these words would sink deep into our consciousness because we know that we think well of ourselves. We think we're not too bad. And even as believers, we think we're pretty good. We've got a good track record and none of it means anything apart from the Lord Jesus. We pray for ourselves in our self-righteousness. We pray for ourselves in our religious achievement. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd have mercy on us. 
Help us to see the predicament of the unreached. Help us to understand your diagnosis of the world, this mongrel world, and see that all these things flow from the fruit of idolatry, which is the great lie. And our Father, we pray that all of these truths would accumulate to cause us to love our Lord Jesus more, to speak of him more, and to trust him wholeheartedly. And we pray this in his name. Amen.